My name is Matti Hairu. I am an antinatalist philosopher. And my name is Amanda Sukunik. I'm an antinatalist activist. And welcome to a very special episode of Hunky Kanto, Falling into the Antinatal Abyss, episode four, Between Happiness and Extinction. As many of you know, Antinatalist Advocacy, which is a relatively new UK-based antinatalist activist group found, uh, founded by the wonderful Lawrence Anton and John Williams, very recently held the Antinatalist Advocacy Conference, Antinatalism at a Crossroads. Crossroads, which was a historic and groundbreaking two-day event that featured lectures and speakers discussing some of the most fascinating, challenging, and controversial subjects within antinatalism today. For anyone who hasn't seen both days of the conference yet, and for anybody who might want wish to watch it again, the links to the recordings will be in the description. Featured very prominently as the first lecture of the first day of the conference was an excellent presentation by transhumanist philosopher, co-founder of the World Transhumanist Association, and author of The Hedonistic Imperative, Mr. David Pierce, who we are so excited to have with us today. Hello, David. Welcome to Hockey Kanto. And featured later that same day of the conference was a lecture defending extinction by professor of philosophy at Alto University School of Business, author of many works on the subject of antinatalism, including the upcoming book, Antinatalism, Extinction, and the End of Procreative Self-Corruption, and my co-host here on Hockey Kanto, Mati Hairi. Welcome, Mati. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining me today. After the first day of the conference, audience members had a Discord hangout to discuss the event and participants enthusiastically and unanimously expressed a desire to see the two of you speak with one another and discuss your opposing viewpoints. I never thought we would manage to make this a reality so quickly. And needless to say, I am simply delighted that this has come to be a reality. Uh, the question of if antinatalists should choose the path of bioengineered bliss or extinction is without question one of the most controversial and hotly debated subjects in all of antinatalism. And I know for a fact that I'm not just speaking for myself when I say that seeing something like this happen is a real dream come true. So truly, thanks. Thank you to both of you so much for agreeing to have this very important conversation with one another. Though I occasionally may pose a quick question or comment, my plan is to interject as little as possible into today's discussion. And so now, without further delay, Mati, I hand the floor to you. Thank you, Amanda. I would like to start by, by saying that, that uh, despite the talk about a great debate uh, uh, after, the, after the meeting, uh, the conference, uh, this is not a great debate. This is, this is an open and honest exchange of ideas between David Pierce and me, Matti Hauru, uh, to find out what we think about antinatalism, happiness, and, and extinction. Now, Amanda Sukunik is presiding, making sure that the, the temperature uh, does not exceed that of a polite conversation, not that it would, but just, just in case we have the police officer in there. Uh, the, the conversation is tentatively built around three talking points uh, that I have prepared and, and shown to David before our, this live meeting. And David, would it be all right that, that we proceed based on them? And would you like to say some opening words? Yes. Um, there this is uh, framed as a debate. Uh, I am an antinatalist, and if I thought that antinatalism could bring about the end of suffering and the horrors of Darwinian life, I would be a hard antinatalist. In practice, I'm only a soft antinatalist, and the reason is essentially the nature of selection pressure, uh, that people like us are not going to be spreading our genes to the next generation, whereas other folk, not least religious believers, who think they have a sacred duty to go forth and multiply, they will be the ones who spread their genes. And any solution to the problem of suffering, it's got to be both technically and sociologically feasible. Uh, just one point before we more point before we go on to the deb debate. Essentially, I think we have a duty to all of sentience, not just humans, but also non-human animals, that natural selection is this horrific engine of suffering. And if humans somehow were to disappear tomorrow, then 
unimaginable suffering would continue for hundreds of millions of years. So any solution to the problem of suffering shouldn't just focus on humans. Thank you very much, David. And now that you, uh, in that summary, uh, answered all my questions, let's uh, go to these these questions and and let's uh, answer them one one by one and and perhaps in in some more detail. So my first talking point uh, is per our personal and antinatalism, and the focal question to uh, every uh, to begin with is: Would we like to see everyone to be? childless? Would we like to see everyone to be childless? And I know I would, because it's one of the three things that antinatalism means to me. Uh, it means that I don't have children, I don't intend to have children, and I, I would be pleased if everyone acted like me in that respect. You will notice that I'm not using the Immanuel Kant language of will or, or whatever. I'm, I'm just saying that I, I would be pleased if everybody act, acted like me in this one. But it seems to me and I may be wrong, and I will be corrected if I'm wrong, that, that you would not uh, agree uh, fully uh, with me in there. And it seems to me that this has to do with the phenomenon of selection pressure, which you just mentioned, uh, and that is the right term then, I guess. Uh, and that is the fact that antinatalists are by definition more amenable to childlessness than pronatalists and would peter out if encouraged. Am I, am I on the right track so far, David? Yes, I mean, I too uh, would prefer uh, yeah, uh, people not to bring more life and suffering into the world. I mean, uh, 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 yeah, if you have a child today, that child will be born with an incurable, ghastly disease. Aging will have uh, effectively an opioid addiction, endogenous opioids. That is impossible to satisfy. You'll be bringing more, more suffering into the world. But that's just what I would personally prefer. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Now, now let's do some philosophical hair splitting on on, on that pressure, uh, se selection pressure thingy, uh, because I think that it, or I can see at least two interpretations for for this idea, or what I understand of it. The first one is that it would be undesirable that antinatalists go extinct because they are better people or something. Uh, and this would mean that it's intrinsically wrong to advocate childlessness to them in, in some sense. But secondly, it could be an instrumental argument that our only hope for humankind voluntarily going extinct is to wait until antinatalists outnumber pronatalists, and then we democratically decide not to have any more children. I think I've seen a manuscript arguing this uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it, in this case, it would be instrumentally a mistake to encourage uh, antinatalist abstinence for now. Is one or the other of these what you mean? Or is it something completely different? Yeah, essentially, I would urge people individually not to have children. But my words would, for the most part, just fall on deaf ears that a majority of people, for evolutionary reasons, want to have offspring. Involuntary childlessness so it causes a great deal of suffering. And as I said, the only way I know to essentially phase out Darwinian life, human and non-human animals suffering, the only way I know to bring about extinction literally is genome reform and we are the only species on earth intellectually capable of rewriting rewriting our own source code reprogramming the biosphere blueprints already exist and i think we should be working with life lovers who are the great majority of the population however <laughs> However much suffering uh, most people's lives have, most people say they love life. And I think we need to work with life lovers to fix the problem of suffering. And the abolitionist project, as I see it, involves yep, scrapping factory farming, replacing animal, animal products with cultured meat, uh, giving all prospective parents uh, access to pre-implantation, genetic screening, counseling, genome editing, and in the long run, yeah, using synthetic gene drives to reprogram the biosphere. 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we'll we'll go to that uh, that bit uh, in a, in a minute. But before that, Amanda, do you think that you have you have something to ask or, or comment that doesn't disrupt the general flow of my three points? Uh, I do. I hope that, that it doesn't disrupt the general flow of your three points. Um, I, I, I do want to ask, David, you know, where your theory sort of, I mean, leaves antinatalist activism today. And also just the general idea of like, our parents weren't antinatalists, right? So is antinatalism a genetic mutation? And if so, where where is antinatalism coming from? Again, if I, if if my parents weren't antinatalists, I have no antinatalists anywhere in my lineage. Why are we here? And how did it get so strong all of a sudden? Like, why are we at a point in history now where we have antinatalists, like quite a lot of antinatalist podcasts now, I think six running total at the minute, you know, antinatalist conference and this like growing presence of antinatalists in society. What, why is this happening uh, now? And just, yeah, I, what, what is, what is antinatalism? How are people like genetics? us? How are people like us possible? Essentially, as far as I can tell, uh, depression, low mood, is in many circumstances fitness enhancing. Keeping one's head down, depressive realism, low mood, depression, seems to be an adaptation to group living. Uh, uh, Non-social animals, they may suffer, but there's no indication that they get depressed and yeah hundreds of millions of people you know very very large minority hundreds of millions of people worldwide are clinically or subclinically depressed uh and sometimes depression can be extremely fitness enhancing it leads to some forms of cognitive superiority so-called depressive realism uh and yeah, it's obviously it's not as though evolution has been selecting for antinatalism, but as a, as as a byproduct of se of selecting for this conditionally activated predisposition to low mood. Yes, some people become antinatalists. Some people try to take their own lives. Some people just plunge on. Good question, Amanda, and, and we'll we'll write a paper about that uh, uh, when we have the, the time. It's it will be a question for us as well. How does any of this happen realistically? But now perhaps some of some of that stuff in the second talking point, and this is uh, on universal antinatalism and its alternatives. And, and David very much is is sort of well either both or, or an alternative. If I understand you correctly, David, you believe that while humankind will not voluntarily choose extinction, we will not silently go away, you are still thinking that suffering could be eliminated and unforeseen happiness achieved in time with genetics, medical technology and the like. And I have two questions about that. And the first one, well, obviously you've heard this a million times, but this is the million and first time, uh, the realism of the scenario. You have been on the case for 30 years now, and there has not, as far as I can see, I've been around for these 30 years as well, been any considerable improvement. I mean, we have a few new techno gadgets. We have exotic treatments for a very limited number of people in the global north, and we have on top of that, a couple of billion of, of uh, new sufferers uh, talking about the human kind alone. So without any any irony or, or any any challenge, but the, the real challenge that you know is there, when can we expect the turn for the better and on, on con what conditions will this happen? Yeah, very good question. Um, a few years ago, as we know, in China, the first designer babies were born with CRISPR technology. And I thought it possible, and it seemed possible at first, that China would claim the credit and we would be on the brink of a reproductive revolution of designer babies. In practice, these babies were conceived in extremely unfortunate circumstances. The cover story was HIV resistance, given that the mutation in question improves cognition in animal models. The scientist in question was probably trying to create designer smart babies. 
as we know, China uh, squashed this experiment, and so the reproductive revolution has been uh, has been postponed. Nonetheless, in the past, yeah, what thirty years? And so, how many years? Twenty-seven years, or whatever, since I wrote the heat, the hedonistic imperative. There has been a great deal of genetic progress. In principle, now at any rate, any prospective parent could choose the. For example, the level, the, uh, a benign allele of the SCN9A gene, and this will determine the pain tolerance or pain sensitivity of their child. Nonsense mutations, complete inability to experience pain, but also absence of nociception. A benign mutation can be associated with very high pain tolerance. If you've ever met those rare people who say, oh, pain, it's just a useful signaling mechanism, it would be possible to fix the problem of physical pain if we are prepared as a society, as a civilization, to take responsibility for, for our future offspring. Mental pain is much more complicated, but uh, in, in the news two or three years ago was Joe Cameron, this retired Scottish school teacher, vegan, thought she was completely normal but she experiences essentially no pain. She is never anxious, never depressed, has gone through life essentially animated by gradients of mild bliss. She's got a couple of mutations of the far and the far out genes, which, le which lead to unusually high levels of anandamide for the Sanskrit for bliss. And in principle, there is no reason now why it's not possible to do a controlled trial and if the trial is successful then we will know that essentially mental and physical pain can be can be tamed can be trivialized before getting rid of all suffering i think realistically one should be aiming for uh, ramping up hedonic set points hedonic range trivializing uh, 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 mental uh, mental and physical pain uh, it's vital to preserve uh, information sensitivity, but all those caveats and qualifications aside, if as a society we are prepared to, yeah, essentially embark on genome reform, the problem of suffering is fixable. And unlike antinatalism, this solution doesn't fall victim to selection pressure because flash forward to whether it's 30 years or 50 years and prospective parents can, well, they can choose not to have children at all, which Matty and I and Amanda would urge, or they can choose the approximate hedonic set point, hedonic range and pain tolerance of their offspring. And so many parents, if you ask them, will say today, oh, as long as my child is happy, I don't mind. That's a, they, they say that's their overriding concern. I'm quite sceptical. A lot of parents are extremely ambitious for their children. But nonetheless, no parent, and I think that's a very strong statement, no parent wants to have a, a depressive child. And over time, one can imagine intensifying selection pressure against a lot of our nastier alleles and allelic combinations. And yeah, uh, so that, I mean, that's the gist of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, for the benefit of our, our, our audience who will be interested in the timeline, I'm going to have to insist a, a little bit. Let me, let me, uh, um, Say say something to lead into this. I'm reminded of of Aubrey de Grey, the British uh, medical gerontologist or whatever he calls himself, who has famously said that that all the diseases and all all that can be can be cured, and that the first person who will reach the age of a thousand years has already been born. Well, Aubrey de said that twenty years ago, and perhaps he was correct. Who knows? But anyways, I also saw, or, or was it in the Antinatalist Advocacy Conference, uh, heard you say something about 100 years or 200 years when, when uh, the last person uh, will have the last uh, bad episode of depression or, or pain or, or something like that. So do you have, do you have some years uh, or some timeline in mind, just for our audience? 
Yeah, in Hedonistic Imperative, I predicted the world's last unpleasant experience would be a few centuries from now, probably some obscure marine invertebrate. And I haven't really shifted this time time this timeline. If a global consensus existed for fixing the problem of suffering, then uh, it could be done. Uh, I mean, this, uh, say a hundred years that's a convenient figure 90 or 110 i don't know uh essentially there doesn't seem any insuperable technical objection to doing so uh but of course there will be a great deal of resistance to the idea of designer babies a majority of people probably if pressed will acknowledge that it's morally acceptable to use uh, genetic engineering to, to cure well-known diseases, but they are extremely queasy and often opposed to the idea of, of enhancement, as it, as it would be called. Now, personally, I, I regard the notion that ratcheting up hedonic range, hedonic set points, fixing the problem of physical pain as enhancement, that's that's that, that, that's simply wrong. Our more advanced successors will see anything we do today as, as remediation. But yeah, the E word sooner or later is going to crop up. People will put you on the spot and ask you, well, are you arguing for eugenics? And either one aims for some kind of, uh, what's it called, linguistic uh, rec reclamation in the way various derogatory words for black people, gay people, for women and so on, attempts have been made to reclaim them. One could go down the route and say, yes, I do believe in eugenics, that a commitment to the well-being of all sentients had nothing to do with the race hygiene policies of the Third Reich. Or one could aim to scrap the word altogether and use a term like genome reform. But uh, critics may not be so kind. Essentially, yes, I'm arguing for eugenics, good genes. Yeah, it's, it's well, I can see a simple solution with the problem uh, to, to this one. You could simply roll the ball to your critics corner and say it's up to you. Uh, if you choose uh, to to give societies billions to to this kind of research, well, this is what Aubrey de Grey is saying about age, aging, uh, then it would be solved in 50 or 100 years. But if you are stalling, then it will take a thousand years and more suffering. But the problem, of course, with that, and you know it is, that then then I say, if all, all the resources of our modern societies go to genetic engineering and developing that right now, then what about uh, the third world and global south? And are we not going to do anything about the problems of the poor? Are we concentrating on the right thing if we are just going for the well-being of us, basically? And I know one there's thing, no good... Yeah, good I, one thing, thing about uh, 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 genome reform, both... Uh, somatic gene therapy and designer babies germline engineering uh, or just simply pre-implantation genetic screening and counseling which isn't designer babies is that it's extremely cost effective and uh, not many do you catch the well-known sort of nasty genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis if one considers something like depression, depressive disorder, I hate, hate, hate thinking about what depression costs the world economy. It's, I mean, comp you know, compared to economic, economic growth, it's, yeah, well, depression is an obscene condition. But nonetheless, it is the case that depressive disorder, both outright clinical depression and probably more common subclinical depression is a tremendous burden on economic growth. And if you're screening, not just for the well-known genetic diseases, but for alleles, allelic combinations that predispose to depression, other forms of mental illness, pain disorders, then you will be increasing economic growth. Uh, and the actual cost of, 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 uh, of, of genome editing, having your genome sequenced, uh, yeah, essentially has collapsed. I mean, there will be cost constraints. I mean, something like I talk about rightly about reprogramming the global ecosystem and a pan species welfare state. 
there will be massive expenses there. But in terms of if if prospective parents want to make sure they have uh, an innately happy, healthy baby, then it won't be prohibitively expensive to do so, even in the third world. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, David. Tentatively, tentatively sold, and 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 of course, yeah, it's <clears throat> it is it is it is an interesting uh, question. As long as as long as nobody says that there's a trickle down effect that when we are curing our own diseases, then the global south will somehow within decades benefit as well. But anyways, that that's uh, not my point here. That was the realism of, of the scenario. But then secondly, and this is more important for me philosophically or ethically or moral philosoph philosophically, and it is, does it, the end justify the means in your model? And I mean that the means uh, now is an unspecified period of what we have now, without even the nice moral consolation of preaching the good uh, anti-natalist gospel, uh, which we cannot do because of the, the, the pressure thingy. And the end is that all humankind will live happily ever after, after these good things have happened. Is there, well, that's a challenge to you. Uh, does the end justify the means like this in your in your thinking? Um, I don't believe that the, the end justifies the means in an objectionable sense. I'm saying that the only way I know to fix the problem of suffering in humans and non-humans alike involves mm -hmm. editing our sinister genetic source code. Uh, and this, is, as I said, my prediction is it, go, is it, is it, is it it's going to take centuries. Uh, but the reason I'm I'm advocating genome reform as part of a broader strategy of phasing out uh, uh, suffering is not because I it's not some kind of uh, ends justify the means. It's just simply it's it's the only way to do so that is is both technically and sociologically credible. We need to build a the broadest possible coalition with life lovers, both secular and religious. And it came as a bit of a, a shock to me, but a majority of people, if you ask them right now, will say, yes, they're happy. I mean, a very large minority will say they are uh, depressed or unhappy, but for evolutionary reasons, yeah, uh, essentially, <laughs> Nature produces a, a very large number of optimists too. And yeah, the future belongs to life lovers, not people like you or me. Uh, I suspect uh, successors will say that people like you and me are in this grip of some kind of depressive psychosis from a bygone era. Although posterity may be smart in some ways, I think they'll have, a, have a, an immense blind spot in that regard but yeah I, I, I see our responsibility is to create a world in which people like you and me don't exist a world underpinned by genetically programmed gradients of bliss yep thank you very much I I, I may come back to this a little bit but for now I'm uh, letting you off the hook and and leaving you in the claws of uh, Amanda here Amanda do you have <laughs> something else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have so much to say, but I, I, I mean, I'll sort of repeat a question that Lawrence sort of asked you is, you know, just the the fears of it all going wrong, because that's the thing that scares me the most about transhumanism. I mean, I fully admit if we were to try for an extinctionist future, a lot could go wrong there, too. Like an incredible amount could go wrong. But the idea of trying to genetically engineer bliss and ending up with you know gradients of suffering hitherto unknown seems like a real possibility and then you know yes i life does seem to produce a lot of life lovers it also seems to produce a lot of hate so in this interim period where you have people who have been genetically engineered to experience no suffering all bliss you're still going to have all these people whose parents have not decided that for them and that seems that seems like a bad that seems like something that creates all kinds of us versus them and potential for a conflict and 
Uh, what do you think about and any of that? Oh, absolutely. What are all the ways things could go wrong? Where does one start? Uh, but as I'm sure we'd, we'd all agree, or well, everyone here uh, today, all children are genetic experiments. And if you, as most prospective parents do, if you consider it ethical to conduct these unplanned, untested genetic experiments, is it good or bad to roll the genetic dice? Uh, should one try to load the dice in favour of your children? And though I said countless things can go wrong, but even today, you know, if someone has a, a nonsense mutation of the SCN9A gene, they simply can't feel pain. Unfortunately, the nonsense mutations also abolish nociception. So this is not what I'd argue for as, as, as a transhumanist. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, whereas some complex traits like uh, intelligence uh, modulated by goodness knows how, how many thousands of alleles. It may well be that a handful of genetic tweaks can essentially fix the problem of suffering. I mean, I've mentioned so far only only three genes. It may well be that ensuring that offspring have benign alleles for simply those three genes essentially defangs suffering. Uh, I, I've been talking a lot about genome reform. Before uh, <laughs> reforming the, the, the rest of the animal kingdom, the first thing we need to do is to shut and outlaw the, uh, the death factories. Uh, yeah, factory farming, slaughterhouses, absolutely monstrous evil. In practice, rather than a moral argument alone, animal agriculture is going to be phased out thanks to cultured meat and farm-free animal products over the next few decades. Yeah, that's that, that, that's going to be vital too. Um, a lot of people would assume uh, that wild animal suffering, of which there are un an unspeakable amount of wild animal suffering, that this problem is intractable. After all, if you if you help non-human animals in, in nature, feed starving herbivores in winter, you get a population explosion followed by more suffering. But blueprints now exist for compassionate stewardship of the of the whole of nature. One can use fertility regulation, cross species fertil fertility regulation, herbivorize predators. If you want to spread, and this is very counterintuitive, if you want to spread happy genes, low pain genes across an entire species, it is in principle technically feasible to do so and quite cheaply too, even if the mutation in question would normally carry a fitness cost to the individual. And this sounds completely ecologically, scientifically illiterate, but that is the astonishing power of gene drives. Normal process, Mendelian inheritance, uh, 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 but uh, gene drives are now allow us to cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance and ensure all the offspring, rather than just 50%, uh, receive the uh, desired mutation. Gene drives are first going to be used to defeat vector-borne disease in Africa. If you can ensure all Anopheles mosquitoes that, uh, 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 that, uh, uh, re that reproduce have a single gender, you can drive the species to extinction, but it will also be possible to use synthetic gene drives to yeah, modulate everything from population sizes to pain tolerance to happiness and do this for hundreds of thousands of species. Right now, this probably sounds, uh, well, it is. It's astonishingly technically ambitious and not sociologically viable. But uh, hundreds of million, I don't know how many, how many biblical literalists are there in the world? Uh, many millions of uh, religious believers uh, believe in the literal truth of the Bible and the book of Isaiah, this vision of a world where the lion and the wolf lie down with the lamb. If and when we are ready to create a happy biosphere, we have the technical tools to do so. The level of 
of pain and suffering and happiness is going to be an adjustable parameter. Thank you, Amanda. Good question. And thank you, David. Very thorough answer. And now we are ready to move uh, on to talking point three. So to remind you, the first one was on our personal antinatalism. The, the second one was uh, about the alternative, the happy, uh, the hedonistic imperative. And now the third one is approaching uh, uh, on extinction. And first to summarize our main differences, uh, and I will just list them first and then we'll go through them one by one. You would not like to see all human reproduction end, while I would like to see all human reproduction end. You see happy making technology as a solution. I don't see happy making technology as a solution. You do not include human extinction among your desired ends. I do include human extinction among my desired ends. And all that makes you a slightly gloomy optimist and, and me a weirdly cheerful pessimist uh, for whatever that's worth. But so let's go uh, through this one by one. So I said that you would not like to see all human reproduction end, correct or incorrect? So long as humanity uh, took it upon itself to phase out all reproduction in nature too, so effectively Darwinian life died out, uh, this would eliminate the risk of suffering recurring again. But trouble is, this is, this is utopianism, and there's a real risk of alienating people who are potentially friends and allies. Uh, so I, obviously one can conduct all kinds of utopian thought experiments, but I think personally that it's much more fruitful to focus on uh, technical ways to fix the problem of suffering. And in so doing, in the long run, one is going to be bringing about human extinction. Uh, but I think it most likely that humans will go extinct, not in some apocalyptic uh, mega, uh, yeah, mega extinction event, or even slowly via antinatalism. But we start off by tweaking our source code, and the tweaking gets more extensive, turns into radical editing, uh, and yeah, essentially Darwinian life goes it goes extinct. And a, a colourful new agey like metaphor would be, you know, a chrysalis turning into a butterfly or something like that. So one has to choose one's audience uh, carefully. But people are scared by the thought of human extinction. It conjures up images of death and destruction. Whereas uh, talk of genome ref reform coming some becoming something beautiful, maybe something sublime one can potentially at any rate win over an audience in the way one can't with remorseless focus on the negative. Yes, yeah. I'm Everything that you are saying resonates with my, my 1990s brain when I used to be a more straightforward utilitarian, I toyed with the idea of, of being a negative utilitarian, but it was way too dangerous for an academic career. Back, back then to, to do any anything of the sort. So I, I uh, went down your road basically and, and, and just uh, I was just a critic of, uh, or well, sort of a critic of um, genetic technologies and all that, you know, the kind of critic that, that the European Union hired uh, to their projects to, to say the, the least damaging thing to, to all these, these things and not have the real uh, ethicists in there. Anyways, that was about me, but, but about me because uh, what you were saying resonated wonderfully with my consequentialist self. But then uh, for 20 years, uh, I have been learning about these all uh, different kinds of moralities like the Aristotelian one or the Kantian one. And, and I now somehow think that I would like to see human reproduction end not only because I would like to see the end of suffering, but also I would like to see the end of manipulation, because I've come to think that, that parents um, will sort of necessarily manipulate their children uh, in, in ways that go, well, against my idea of autonomy, if you will, of human freedom, something like that. And then I think that it's a nasty 
nasty practice anyway. So uh, whatever the suffering factor, even if you remove all the suffering, I might still say, yes, but let's stop the manipulation too. Let's stop reproduction now. So that was just an explanation. And if no, you have thank any... you for sharing. Yes, I mean, I should, I haven't, have I mentioned it? No, I'm, I'm a, a strict negative utilitarian. But on strict negative utilitarian grounds, I believe one, for example, should uphold in law the sanctity of life. Not because I literally believe life is sacred, but because I think it probably leads to better consequences or at least less terrible consequences in the long run. If one, uh, you know, just what, like one relies on one's doctor, and I'm sure some you know, chronic pain specialist will be thinking, my patients would be better off dead. But nonetheless, one doesn't want doctors bumping off uh, patients without uh, their, their permission. So yeah, uh, on negative utilitarian grounds, I think we should be aiming for this transhumanist vision of a world with a, a new architecture of mind, information sensitive gradients of, of, of well-being. So I mean, this, it, it can sound paradoxical, uh, but as far as I can tell, the 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 the, the Benetarian extinctionist hard anti-natalist position, it's always going to be marginal. I'm sure you found it in your own career. There's a lot of people they're not engaging with you; they simply switch off. And I I don't know. I could I I I, I could be wrong. Um, and. Yeah, I think hard antinatalist, extinctionist antinatalists need to come to terms with the nature of, of selection pressure. And there's another factor too, in that a lot of people have come to antinatalism because either they themselves or a loved one has suffered from chronic pain or depression or both. And one thing about low mood and depression is that it doesn't tend to make successful active citizens, doesn't tend to promote successful organization building and politics. Uh, um, yes, uh, I mean, this doesn't by itself, this, as I said, some people will, will just say reflexively, oh, you're, you're, you're just depressed. I know some, some non-depressed uh, uh, antinatalists. But nonetheless, if you do look at antinatalists worldwide, yeah, uh, uh, a lot of us have at some time rather in the uh, past, sometimes today, suffered a great deal in their lives. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I think that in this newly found uh, antinatalist philosopher role that I, I have, I, I learned that I'm an antinatalist uh, two or three years ago. Uh, by reading it on the internet that Matti Harrison uh, is a famous antinatalist. What what is antinatalism? I said. Anyway, I uh, in in this role I I see it uh, uh, as my duty and my job to tell people about good arguments and and not all good arguments are utilitarian, negative or positive utilitarian. Some of them are, for instance, Kantian. And I think that there is a Kantian argument for both your happy uh, making technology and for for uh, the insistence on on antinatalism despite the selection pressure and that's i just read uh, immanuel kant's uh, perpetual peace and one of the points that he was making was that although perpetual peace may sound like a really ufo idea and never to be achieved at uh, any point it's still a moral politician will not say this out loud because it will become a self-fulfilling nasty prophecy that the perpetual peace would have been possible perhaps. But now these politicians, these immoral politicians are, are making it impossible by saying that it's impossible. So that, that would be a point for, for your happy technology and, and it would be a point for, for antinatalism despite the fact that, that then there will be fewer antinatalists in proportion. Or is there any, any mileage in that kind of thinking? Just, I mean, essentially, uh, 
something like deontology or virtue ethic, ethics can be con consequentialized in the sense that one can say virtue ethics what, uh, leads to better consequences. Like, likewise, one can uh, argue that utilitarians would be well advised to uh yeah to take a kind of a deontological approach most of the time thou shalt not tell a lie all kinds of stuff that sounds very unutilitarian um but although i tend to be a head in the clouds kind of uh, person i would really like to get back to the question of practicalities is one arguing for extinctionist antinatalism because one thinks Morally, it's the right thing to do uh, um, on a personal level, or does one think that it's really going to be possible to have a plan to extinguish all human life and indeed all Darwinian life on Earth? And I haven't come across any realistic scenario, uh, detailed scenario that plots out how human extinction or or the extinction of Darwinian life is going to going to come about uh, via uh, antinatalist means. Yes, I, I do think that there is something of uh, of the the uh, end justify uh, the means consequentialism in you. I'm very familiar with that because I've, I've basically believed in that that idea all my all my life, but I'm just trying to wriggle out of it somehow and i'm i have come across this term prefiguration so uh what what i do my means uh, uh, are aligned with the ends already and so my argument my factual argument to you is that with your happy making technology you are making more people more sufferers to end suffering at the end whereas i am the pure uh, prefigurative one by not having children thereby using the means that that are, are already the end. Does that resonate with you in any way? In one sense, it resonates. But I think one needs to see beyond kind of kind of personal purity that by not having children and not bringing more suffering into the world, one fulfills one's ethical responsibilities in, in a personal sense. But as I was touching on earlier, it's not going to fix the problem of, of suffering. And I think we need to be practically focused. And there are all kinds of ways now, all kinds of technologies that in principle, at any rate, allow us to phase out and eventually end suffering, make it physically, physiologically impossible. And... I don't know how long it will take. I said my best guess is it will be centuries. I could be optimistic. It could, you know, it could take thousands. It could, it could take thousands of years. But if suffering still exists, let's say, three hundred years from now, it won't be because it proved technically too possible, technically too hard to eliminate. It will be because our successors decided, for whatever ever reason, to retain it. Uh, yeah. I think that we've found the, the, the key to our, the rest of our differences. Extinction for you is not, not a desired end in the sense that you would be aiming at it. Uh, for me, it is. I'm, I seem to be extinctionist uh, more than an antinatalist. So Amanda, make a note. Matti is not an antinatalist. We have to change the Hanke Kanto uh, <laughs> beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. And it explains your 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 gloomy optimism, and it explains my my cheerful full pessimism, and, and and what have you. But the the real difference was what you just said that I'm th thinking now of my personal purity, and I'm thinking that that as long as I'm pure, then everything is fine, fantastic. And you are thinking of of humanity. Good for you, Amanda. Do you have something to to say uh, before we go to the end? Um, yeah, I mean, on on the subject of, of manipulation. So in a world of engineered bliss, we have these humans who can experience suffering. Um, this is still a this is a manipulative choice that these procreators have made for these beings. So my question is, in addition to the removal of suffering, would we also be removing 
something intellectual. Like, would they not understand that this was a manipulation of their beings? And and my, like, to what extent would we have to historically remove evidence of concepts of antinatalism that might, you know, implant the concept of procreative manipulation into them? Um, I mean, I, I just, I, I, I wonder a lot what they would do with a concept like that. Um, and if they wouldn't be able to understand this concept, is there is there something not sort of slightly, I don't know, perverse about that? I don't know what ex- exactly the, what word to use. It's it's sort of similar to like knitting while the house is burning down around you, or like smiling while you're being eviscerated. I just don't. I just see the creation of those kinds of beings as um, not justifiable, all because everything seems to be sort of predicated on procreators will suffer if they're not allowed to do this and um i i just sort of sometimes feel like maybe you're giving up on antinatalist advocacy a little too fast like are you know can we not are are there any do you think that there's any ethical means of preventing people from having children i guess that's another piece of my my question here i mean what if we made people pay the full cost of what it is what it what it is to actually produce a child i mean what if we produce well i'll, I'll let you go ahead <laughs> Just threw a is it? i mean tens of millions of people worldwide suffer from involuntary childlessness people will go to quite extraordinary lengths to reproduce you know there are cases in india of people in their 70s having have, having having twins uh yeah I, though on a personal level as i said i i advocate antinatalism i think yeah the only long-term solution is genome reform and what I, the question i would ask uh, both uh, you know, amanda and, and and matty do you think having children is inherently wrong or is it wrong only because it will cause suffering. I mean, as, as you were touching on this, this question of autonomy, in a world based entirely on genetically programmed gradients of, well, of, of well-being, is it ethical to bring new life into the world given one is not bringing new suffering into the world? One is bringing this being into existence without prior consent, and yet the being in question, the child, whatever you, when it is he or she is is created happy people find life self-evidently wonderful it's it's not a a, a cerebral thing essentially the happier you come become the more meaningful uh life life seems uh and i don't regard uh ethical natalism as a, an oxymoron a contradiction in terms as it is today uh Unfortunately, this scenario is currently sci-fi. I, I think, sadly, that a world without suffering is going to be uh, centuries away. But I, sadly, don't see the alternative. Successful prophets tend to locate salvation and doom in their own lifetime, which is why saying that we're going to fix the problem of aging or something in the next 20, 30 years, uh, or Ray Gray or Ray Kurzweil that we're on the brink of super intelligence uh, will solve all our problems. That's a good, I mean, I, I accept both, both gentlemen in question actually believe this scenario, but sadly, I can't say that I think it's going to happen this century within the lifetime of of the audience. I think it's yeah, it, 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 it's yeah. Thank you, thank you, David. And let's let's agree that David is free to to continue his his happy machine building, and and we are we are free to to continue our manipulation seeking uh, mission. And now we go for for the end, the outro of this. And the only notes that I wrote for this is. Whatever anyone has to say, and Amanda, who has been free to enter the exchanges all along, closes the proceedings. All right. Well, wonderful. Well, I just want to say a huge, tremendous thank you to both of you. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Uh, I, I do, I do, in fact, wish it could go on for several more hours, but uh, I am quite satisfied with where we've ended up uh, at right now. Um, so, just once again, thank you so much to both of you. Um, do either of you have anything that you'd like to say to close out? I'm done.
I wish I could uh, end on something uplifting, uh, but no, uh, a Darwinian life is absolutely monstrous. Nothing we've said in this discussion has even begun to hint how ghastly it can be. But sadly, I think we're stuck. We're going to have to work together with life lovers to alleviate and I hope in the end get rid of suffering in our forward like home. And this is probably monstrously unfair of me, and I can cut it out. But to answer the question that you that you did ask, David, that I completely forgot to answer, I do think that even if we're it's a matter of beings not suffering, that procreation is intrinsically unethical. I think it's always a manipulation of that being. So even if we're producing beings that can't suffer, there is it, it is completely unethical to, to do so. And I do think that it's very sad. It is suffering that people want children and for whatever reason can't have them. I mean, I, I do acknowledge that that's real suffering in the world, but I think that the, I, I can't help but put the suffer that suffering on the scale of creation and, and not find the creation of the new being to be a much heavier weight, uh, and I, I, I just don't know that genetically re-engineering humanity for the sake of ameliorating that suffering is exactly the road I would take. So I remain an extinctionist. Amanda, now you are, now you are arguing after, after hours. So what part of <laughs> Amanda closes the proceedings? Did you not no, understand? No, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, will, I will end it now. All right. Thank you so much to both of you. Wonderful. What have we done to deserve this burden? Boop, boop.